Thanks for that piece of shit, Lieutenant, that's always uh, on his podcast. Pass us. F- <laughs> All right, everybody, Eric Dim, your most complained cop, NYPD. This is your 265 Police Live series brought to you by the finest of filtered. And along with me is the founder and the co-host of the podcast, John McCarry, retired lieutenant. What's up, my brother? Feeling good, baby. Got my new uh, finest unfiltered pin over here, New York's finest retired unfiltered podcast. You know, this is going to be running around the halls of 1PP. I, I, would only, I don't recommend doing that, actually, if you're still on. But... <laughs> They'll be available for sale soon. We'll, we'll, uh, but I'll bring you some when I'm in New York. Well, before we get into the podcast, um, I'm glad you're still alive, considering we're under attack by Kaz and, and his assassins. How's your basement? <laughs> oh, it's, it's, I mean, I'm just starting to build it out. You know, it's, uh, it'll be one of the first in Florida, but it, it'll be good. <laughs> Outstanding. <laughs> Outstanding. So we had a great show. If everyone had an opportunity to watch our last podcast, we talked about how the NYPD has brought the weight of the department against the finest unfiltered, along with other retired members who will, should be enjoying retirement, of course, and have a voice and talk about the police department, the pit bulls in New York City, and the politics that surround policing as we, as we know it, what's going on right now. But speaking of politics and policing, let's talk about the How Many Stops Act proposal that's going on with the city council right now, led by Jamani Williams, public advocate in New York City. John, what are your thoughts on that? I again, it's just another clear example of how far I, I don't even like I like I keep using the word progressive. I think I really have to get away from using that word. I, I really think we should just start moving towards calling them communist socialists. Um, because that's really what they are. I mean, it's uh they're out of their minds. It's completely New York City has become a victim last society, a criminal first society. And the police are genuinely the bad guy. The police are being made out to be the bad guy. So New York City Council introduces this bill, um, uh, Council Member of Velez, along with Jamani Williams and a lot of other progressive members of the New York City Council. Jamani Williams is the public advocate. He is not a member of City Council, but he weighs in on this because supposedly he believes himself to be an expert. Why? I have no idea. Um, And basically, this bill is that they want every... They call it the how many stops bill, but they basically want every encounter with a New York City police officer on New York City streets to be documented. Not only is it an impossible task, it begs the question, for what? Well, I think it's great that we talk about this bill. But before we talk about the bill, I think we should actually talk about what's the position right now for the law in New York City, and actually nationwide, right? So ultimately, what we have is a case called People versus the Boar. Our cops are aware of it, and they should be heavily delved into it. But for our viewers out there, if you're not non-law enforcement or family members of, of law enforcement, and everybody should know this. So People versus the Boar is about intrusion. And that, I believe, is the dichotomy between the actual shield that a police officer wears nationwide in comparison to a security guard. And I say this all the time. A security guard observes, reports, and repeats. And what's different about the shield of a police officer is that shield, that iconic shield, is what gives a police officer the right to be intrusive. And I always talk about this. John talks about this also. Intrusive police work is the bedrock to policing and public safety. And what's important to understand about uh, people versus the board is that there are four levels of intru- intrusion. So in 1976, there was a court case that surrounded this agile case, and it came up to a four-tiered system. And the tops of of the four-tiered system, obviously, is probable cause. So that means reason to believe someone committed a crime. That's documented by arrest paperwork. Level three, which means you you suspect someone of committing a crime or about to commit a crime, that gives the police officer the right to detain someone, either forcibly or by word of mouth, to investigate a crime. And that gets documented by the police department in New York City, which was heavily weighed on in the stop, question, first trial. That really changed a lot of the nomenclature of the city as we speak when it comes to public safety. But level one and level two is the part that is the component to this bill. John, you want to get into that and talk about why it's so important that we explain? I think we should break up level one and two 
compared to three and four. So I, as I said, level four is probable cause. And level three, you reasonably suspect someone committed a crime. And then we have level one and two. Uh, and John, I think it's a good opportunity for to break it down when we start getting into this. Sure. Let's get into level one, like a level one stop, a request for information. It's not really a stop. It's an encounter. Could be a stop. Could be a crime happened the next day. Detectives, they're not trying to detain you, but they walk up. Hey, ma'am, did you hear anything last night? Hey, ma'am, did anything? Did you see anything weird around here last night around 8 p.m.? Um, that and that and that, that's a request for information. Um, and on according to this how many stops bill, that is something that would have to be documented. Now, it is documented if the person did give a positive response. Oh, I actually did. I actually did uh, hear something last night. You know what I mean? Then that would be documented on a DD-5 by the detectives. That would be ran through something. Now, if it was an everyday police officer, might not be documented. He might just relay that information, get the, the woman's info for the detectives to review later on. That might not be documented anywhere. But the the, the egregious part of this bill, I think, and, and you know, me and Eric were just discussing this, is say you're on a New York City street. You're in... Midtown South, one of the most populated areas in New York City at all times, regardless, one of the most populated areas in the world at any time of the day, 24 seven. And someone comes up to you and asks you for directions. How do I get to wherever? Now, if you just elicit a response, oh, take the take the one train and go down to Soho, get off of the Soho station, that would not require you to document. However, you're standing on that same corner. That person comes up to you and they ask you, how do I get to wherever? And now you ask, well, what time do you have to get there? Because you're trying to determine what's the best route for that person to take. That requires you to document that. That would be considered how many stops. That's one of those how many stops. Absolutely ridiculous. Eric, you want to get into what level two is? Uh, absolutely. So I, I used to really break this down and speak to my cops constantly. We used to go over these levels of intrusion over and over until we're blue in the face. Even at this point in retirement, I still read it again as we're doing this podcast because it's just so intricate. And I, I look back and I used to teach my cops again, as I said, level three and level four. Imagine it's in one bucket. And in a separate bucket would be level one and level two. And the reason why I say it is because level three and level four requires documentation. And it makes sense. Why? Because level four, you're putting someone under arrest. That's probable cause. Obviously, there's going to be paperwork associated with that. Level three, you're detaining someone, right? So you are utilizing the Fourth Amendment. So we as citizens are right to the Fourth Amendment, which is our right to seizure. When we detain someone, we are intrusive on that Fourth Amendment because we have reason to believe, I'm sorry, reason to suspect you committed a crime. So that requires that requires documentation. Why? Because we have to cover ourselves because there's potential liability, right? Which go, which really correlates with qualified immunity and indemnification because there could be a potential lawsuit because you're detaining someone, detaining someone against their will. But you, as a police officer, because you have observation skills, you have the right to detain that person because you reasonably sus suspect they committed a crime. Now, level one and level two gets really funky, and I think level two is is. Is is hard to really understand, and I think it takes cops years to really understand. Level two, level two is the common law right of inquiry, or some people like to say found the suspicion. So the best way I can give that is a level two encounter. Someone has the right to leave, but ultimately, what I would tell my cops is: imagine you're going on a ladder, and each level is a step, and you're at level one. The goal is to get up that step to level four to solve a crime, and if you don't get to that point, you can work your way back down to those steps and on your way home. So level one, as you said, is request information. For that, you need an objectable reason to approach. Okay. Now for level two, common law right of inquiry, best scenario I could give is this. You want to encounter someone and ask incriminating questions to get you to level three. We have the right to detain them to investigate a crime. That's what cops are supposed to do. Be nosy to solve crimes. So if I would say, let's say, for instance, you have a building and you know that there is narcotics in that building. And they're selling drugs and you see someone enter a building and they come out within seconds. All right. We know it's the chances are they did not get into the elevator. They didn't even have time to get the stairs. They got what we like to say. They got hit off. They got done. They bought drugs and walked out. But 
based on that alone, it's not enough to detain someone, but it's enough to have an encounter to ask incriminating, incriminating questions to raise the level of suspicion to actually make the arrest. So um, I, I hope people understand that, right? So I, for instance, if I saw someone, and, and I'll use the Lower East Side, I used to work on Lower East Side, that was a, a heavily narcotics bill, these narcotics sales. Let's say someone walks into 118 Avenue D, and I know they sell drugs in there, and the person goes in and out. When I encounter that person, I'm not going to say, hey, I saw you going to 118 Avenue D. I'm going to say, where are you coming from? Now, odds are that person's going to lie and say, oh, you know, I'm coming from Avenue B. I was just at a restaurant. Now I have level three. I have the right to detain that person. That gave me the level of suspicion to suspect the narcotic sale did actually happen. John, what are your thoughts on that? I think you gave way too much information to the public right there. But <laughs> no, it's <laughs> that people understand that. Honestly, if you're not, again, I'm going to say, if you're not breaking the law you, or you are a lawbreaker, you should know your rights. Uh, I mean, because again, you say what we're actually are and doing at that point is is we're suspending the Constitution, basically the Fourth Amendment, which is which is a big deal. You know, it's it is it is a very it is a very big deal for police. It's a big deal for the public. I mean, it shouldn't be taken lightly by a police officer or by a member of the public. Um, like we always like to say, though, during these encounters, whether you believe the officers right or wrong, comply. Right. This is why we have courts of law. I mean, we haven't had one incident where we see to go bad when someone doesn't resist arrest or someone doesn't start to act violent and tumultuous. You know, worst case scenario, get yourself arrested, prove in court you did nothing wrong, sue the city and you're going to win a lot of money. Don't worry about it. You're going to get paid way more than what you would have made that <laughs> day at your job. Don't worry about it. Seriously. Good point. Stay calm, you know, and, and don't raise these encounters. But Eric's right. Like, but my, 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 the thing about this, how many stops bill is what they're requiring you to document on is not even a stop. And it's not even an intrusion of your fourth amendment, right? It's actually just day to day interactions with the public. Hey ma'am, how's your morning this morning? I just, I, that's a non-accusatory question, right? I'm at level one, but maybe that person doesn't feel free to leave. Maybe because I'm wearing a uniform, I'm accessing, I'm exercising my authority under the Fourth Amendment. Well, I don't believe that's the case. I believe you're just being a human being. And I believe that's exactly what New York City Council's goal is, is to remove the humanity out of policing. They want robots. They don't want you to be, they don't want this community police relation. It's the worst thing ever. If police and community got along and the overwhelming majority of the police and the community were on the same page and, and, and the good people in the community and the police stood together arm in arm to combat crime, it would be the worst thing ever for a politician. How are they going to sell you on why you should vote for them? And, and that's basically what's going on here is they're trying to remove the humanity out of it. Um, and again, there is a lot of stuff that you're being told and speaking to the public right now that you're being told by politicians, by anti-police groups, that's completely inaccurate. Like Eric gave his little snippet right there, where guess what? You'd lie to us while we're asking you a question. Now you just raised our level of suspicion. You aren't following a lawful order. You're endangering my safety because X, Y, Z, you're causing a large crowd to form or you're reaching into your waistband or you're going into your pocket. You're making this encounter way more dangerous than it needs to be. I think, honestly, at this point, the the fact I, I saw Madri gave like a little a little uh, snip in the, in the newspaper. I saw Hendry gave a little snip in the newspaper about it, kind of barking at that. This is stupid. It, it's going to do it's It's not good much more needs to be said about this much more needs to be said about this this is this is egregious it's egregious bill absolutely everything you said is 100 percent correct but i will say this this is much bigger than people believe it is because they don't understand the complexities of policing again i always say this it's the dunn and kruger effect they don't understand policing because they don't really know what it is so the less you know about a subject the more you think you can do it i do believe that this will actually bring, bring policing to a halt and the reason why I say that is because, look, you and I, you and I say it, right? We attend CCRB meetings on a monthly basis. And one of the biggest complaints that we get, John and I, we hear from the public. 
is there's no relationship with the police officers and the community. They talk about basketball games, they attend different events, and they want to have conversations with the police. They want that humanity. They want to act, they actually want to communicate with the police officers. That's one of the biggest complaints we hear. They will actually they just want to have conversations. They want to talk about basketball, whatever it is. They want to feel the human element to the police officer. But this bill right here will completely deteriorate that and the potential for any relationship be destroyed. Under the de Blasio era, we had the neighborhood coordination officer program. That was supposed to build that relationship, but it went too far extreme where we just completely eliminated intrusive police work. And now we're moving completely to the other side. We'll just destroy any potential game in, in, engagement. Because if you're a police officer and you spend and you have an eight hour workday and six of those hours are out in the street and you're going to be bogged down with doing paperwork for these encounters, you're not going to be in the street. And if you are, well, then you're just going to accrue overtime, which is something that the city council said they're trying to oppose. So the same thing they're, they're opposing, they're actually implementing. So with that being said, I can say this. Level one encounter, which is request for information, the objective research to approach, is something a good police officer, a good cop, should be doing the entire day till their face turns blue. And I, I again, I, I talk about snippets. I like to give this little snippet. I would see this constantly in housing. And it's not just about investigating crime. It's just maintaining your area, knowing your community. And the reason why you give housing, I've worked in housing most of my career. And, and everybody knows this, especially if anyone ever lived in housing, you watch this. You can go in some of these developments, and the addresses are the most confusing things. John, you know you worked in housing. They'll have an address, and it's supposed to be on some street, but it's not actually on the street. It's embedded in, and it's so hard to find. And I would see guys, some young guys, they would be walking with flowers because they, they're bringing it to a girl, and the flower bouquet was so big, and they can't even see. And you could see them looking around, and they're trying to look over the flowers, and they're trying to look at the address. They have no idea where they are. So just being kind and being caring police officers especially in housing custodians of the, of, of the development we'd walk up to them and say hey buddy how you doing need help obviously you're lost can we help you and what happens you end up joking around oh you, you're getting this for some girl what are you doing you having fun you're having a good time you? and you'd have a conversation that's the humanity but guess what now you don't want to have those those encounters you're going to avoid that because you're going to have to document it they just completely deteriorated any chance for humanity Absolutely. You know, I spoke with a few people offline that are proponents of this bill. Um, and basically what they what they're saying is, you know, there's bad stops going on. I'm like, I don't believe that this bill is alleviating any of those bad stops whatsoever. I don't believe this bill has anything to do, has any. The goal is to alleviate bad stops I because I, you're not doing that at this point. You're attacking community. You're you're attacking community and police encounters, interactions, normal encounters day to day, you know. Uh, and, and it's good that we get to know each other and, the, and it only happens through encounters. If you're requiring a cop to write a piece of paper down and that piece of paper is going to be scrutinized to, oh, he missed the check a box or, Hey, you got too many where people didn't give you their name. Oh, you stopped too many black guys. Oh, you stopped too many men. You stopped too many white guys. You stopped too many females, whatever that case may be. You're in Borough Park. You stopped too many Hasidic Jews. You're biased. If now, if you're going to start to scrutinize those papers, which they, which the New York City Police Department ultimately will, which will ultimately be used to go against what they say that they don't have is a quota because they'll be pushing these quotas down on cops. What's going to happen? Cops are going to move and step back from interacting with the public. It's just a, and again, I'm going to say it again. I say it a lot. It's a further emasculation of the police department. You're now... People now they're like the kid in school that's afraid to talk to anybody. Forget about even just talking to the bully. They're afraid to talk to the good people on the street, right? They're afraid to ask any question whatsoever. I'm standing on a corner, 2005. I'm in Port Richmond. Black guy comes walking past me. He's wearing the retro Jordan 4s with the Nike Air on the back. They hadn't released since 1999, I believe. Big fan of Jordan sneakers. I couldn't afford them when I was a kid, particularly the Jordan 3, 4, and 5. You know, my parents didn't have money. My father was severely injured. My mother was a school crossing guard. We had no money. I wore pay less shoes. Everyone in my neighborhood had Jordans on, right? So a big fan of that. And I asked, hey, where'd you get those sneakers from? He's a guy goes, oh, I'm in the rap game. I smirk. He walks away. You know, very stupid interaction. But I'm like, oh, you know, I made I made whatever. Made some type of connection with him that day. He thinks I'm an idiot because he thinks I don't believe him and he leaves. And I and at the time I didn't. Next day on that same foot post, I have a partner. My partner, here comes the same guy, he comes walking. 
He looks at me, shakes his head, keeps walking. I laugh. My partner goes, how do you know him? That's Raekwon the chef from the Wu-Tang Clan. I was like, oh. <laughs> I was like, wow, I feel like an idiot. But then the next time I seen him, I was like, oh, I'm sorry, bro. I'm a big fan. I didn't realize who you were. You know? And then that was just an interaction. You know what I mean? Um, and 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 it grows bonds with the community. Now, now step back to put put that same rookie cop in here, and you have all the older guys telling you the scrutiny and hey, don't put your name on these papers and all these this stuff's gonna come back to bite you in the butt and blah 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 blah. blah. Push that forward. That cop doesn't say a word, even though it's it's literally a non interaction. It's it's more of just a humanity. It's not me as a police officer. That was me as John. Asking a member of the community, where where'd you get those sneakers from? That had nothing to do. I wasn't exercising my authority. I was just standing there interacting with the community. I think that's a fantastic point. And I think it is part of policing, right? It's getting to know your community. You want to know the bad guys? You want to know the good guys? You want to know everyone. You want them to know that you know them? You want them to know you? Hey, this is my beat every day. I'll be here. You know who I am. If you're a good guy... You know, I may need you someday. If you're a bad guy, I may be there someday. So these encounters, as I said before, and I really, I really believe that level one, when it comes to the case, people versus the board, which goes all the way back to 1976. If anybody's curious, Supreme Court cases, Google it, people versus the board, all the way back to 1976. Level one, I think it's all day. That's what a police officer should be doing all day. You're driving in your car, you're at a light, someone pulls up and I see, hey, how you guys doing? Where are you headed? Just to be nosy. You never know. Maybe that's a great encounter. There could be four college kids in there, four kids headed for a basketball game. You have a great conversation. Or you know what? Maybe this, this, maybe that just happens to be someone just commit a robbery and a gun falls out of somebody's pocket just because you were asking a question, just because you're engaged in the community. I think this How Many Stops Act is just completely ludicrous. I think it's absolutely ridiculous. I think it's absurd. I, I Again, I think you made a good point, which I want to reflect on what you said. You said that it has nothing to do with level three and level four has nothing to do with it, 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 you know, about stops. And I agree because these aren't stops. They're just encounters. This should be normal everyday encounters. This is, the, this is the bedrock of policing right here. Being This is what I talk about when I talk about intrusive police work. Intrusive police work is not actually just detaining someone. It's exactly that. Being intrusive on every level that you can because that's what a police officer should do. And not just a police officer. That is what I say is, is being a cop. Is being intrusive, and this will just completely strip it away. Again, further abolishment of the police. This is just insane. And now, really, what it comes down to is, what is your buddy Eric Adams going to do? That's what it comes down to. Oh, Eric, the Swagger Man Adams. I mean, I think his response is very similar to the New York City Police Department's response, the police union's response. And every Republican or even moderate Democrat, you know, the, uh, people ask us, what are we doing in retirement? We're creating a pulpit and we're creating a, a forum for free thought and free speech. And, and it evolves around where we work prior. We were cops. You know, we, we created this. It's, it's very unusual. You never know. But at some point you might see retired sports athletes comment on sports. It'll be crazy. I think that's what's something that we're trying to create here, you know, where now you have retired cops commenting on police policy, legislation, and public safety. It's insane. It's never been done before, right? So it's we gotta we gotta get rid of them. Can't have people those guys, those guys, those guys might be losers for announcing on a sport that they played in before because I mean we were told we were losers for talking about the police work. Those guys need to just go in their basements in Florida and that's it. And they need to go away. So, I mean, that, basically what we do here is we use we created a pulpit and we talk from it to educate and to and to learn ourselves. Right. And to and to be able to advocate as well, to be able to advocate for common sense, public safety. Right. More bigger than the police department to me is pub, overall public safety, because I'm a I'm a I'm a I'm a citizen before I'm anything. Right. And Eric's the same thing. Right. So that that's bigger. We're, we're advocating for overall public safety, you know, and uh, for our children, make the world a better place for our children, using the experiences that we had in the New York City Police Department. But what do we hear from everybody? There's nothing I can do. New York City Mayor Eric Adams. There's nothing I can do. Complete, utter lie. 
complete laziness. It's the same statement as DA is not going to prosecute, so I can't lock them up. It's too many criminals, so we're not going to bother to lock any criminals up. Lazy, lazy, passing the buck to somebody else. Who are we going to blame? The feds? What do you think about that statement, Eric? I There's nothing I can do. I think that statement is complete farce. You and I know, and we should actually read the clause when it comes to the position of the mayor and what opportunity they have to actually combat a silly, ridiculous law that's going to be proposed or possibly on the verge of getting passed by city council, led by a public advocate. That really has nothing to do with city council. I think the whole thing is complete insanity. You have the clause. I think we should read it. Sure. Uh, just one point I want to give before I read how a, how a bill passes in New York. I just want to say, speaking out, identifying who drafted this bill, the 32 members that support it, the two top people, Council Member Aviles and Jumani Williams, I, and, and Public Advocate Jumani Williams, identifying them and advocating against them both in social media, in the press, to the men and women in the New York City Police Department, to the to the citizens and residents in New York City, to the businesses of, uh, of New York City, will put pressure on those 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 uh, city council people to not even push this bill forward. So that let's get that straight. So they're not using their pulpit correctly. That that is everyone. That is the police union. That is the mayor. That is the uh, the management. Because I'm not going to say the leadership because they're not. They're just not. I don't see it. Um, they're not using their pulpit correctly. They use it to they use it to uh, virtue signal for everything else other than what they need to be focused on, which is public safety. This directly affects public safety. This directly endangers everyone in New York City and will further the divide from the police department and New York City residents. So th this is a terrible, terrible bill. So a bill, New York City Council, council members get together. They're going to work on a bill. They're going to write the legislation. This is what we think it should be. Maybe they'll have a committee. And then they'll bring they'll bring in the appropriate committee, right? If I want to pass a bill, this bill, the how many stops bill, I'm going to bring it before the Public Safety Committee of New York City Council. So I'll create the bill, I'll draft the bill, I'll bring it to the Public Safety Committee. Then we'll have a public hearing. We'll hold a public hearing, right? During the day while everyone in New York City is working, the only people that aren't are New York City Council. They'll talk about all these flouting reasons why this bill needs to come like oh uh you know we're we're looking to move towards uh towards proven oh evidence-based public safety strategies they'll they'll speak from their pulpit to demonize the new york city police department the new york city police department sometimes will sit down with them i think in this case they actually did um i don't remember if they did or not uh I i'll take it back but they'll sit down with them they'll go back and forth but ultimately that is not swaying the elected's position on passing that bill, because again, this is meetings during the day. Most people are working. Most people are unaware that this committee is even happening, right? This is something that unions, the police department, common sense politicians should be advocating to get people there to speak out against this bill so that uh, New York City Council would feel the weight and pressure like, hey, maybe we shouldn't pass that. Maybe we will not get reelected next time. Um, that's how it is. After that hearing, City Council votes on the bill. If that bill passes, it comes to Eric Adams' desk. It comes before New York City Mayor Eric Adams. And I'm going to read the statement, the mayoral decision. After a bill is passed, the city council, in the, by the city council, it is presented to the mayor. And that is you, Eric, Eric Adams. You are the mayor of New York City. In case you weren't aware, it's not just for nightlife. This is when you actually have to do work and do your job. Okay. So now they present you the bill. And you have 30 days to either sign that bill in law, to veto the bill, or to take no action. So if the mayor vetoes the bill, it is sent back to New York City Council for them to re-vote on the bill. Now, ultimately, that bill might get passed. But then you could say at that point, well, after you advocate, well, there was really nothing I could do anymore. Um, so that if the mayor... Uh, if if that if that happens and he sends it if he vetoes it and he sends it back to city council, city council can override the mayor's veto, but.
but they need a two third vote now. They need a larger vo or vote than they originally needed to pass the bill, right? So if the mayor doesn't sign or veto the bill within 30 days, it becomes law. So he's saying there's nothing I could do, which meaning he's not going to veto it and he's going to sign it into law. So it's going to become, it's going to just become law because he's lazy, he's incompetent. He probably doesn't even understand how a bill gets passed in New York City. I mean, me and Eric knew it before we even looked it up. We was we talked about. I was like, I think that the, the bill he has to. I don't know what he means. He can't do anything. And and uh, what, what do you think about that, Eric? You know, I think it's ironic about this. Before I actually talk about Mayor Adams, what I think about him and this bill, I just think it's ironic though for for our viewers out there. If you just Google the how many stops actually you actually read about the nomenclature of this actual bill, it actually says in there that this is common sense reform or common sense proposal, something like that, it, which is completely the opposite. This is. The opposite of common sense. It's absolutely ridiculous. I can't believe they re refer to this as common sense. Again, I say it. I think this would be bring policing as a halt. It, it really would bring it to a halt. Who would want to have any engagement? Do you, I mean, people, they just want to bog police down. Can people understand one thing? This is a job just like anywhere else. Every day, people get up and they go to work. When you go to work, do you want to do more paperwork than you have to already? Let's be honest. Police are human. They don't want to do more police. Uh, I'm sorry. They don't want to do more paperwork than they already have to. But since you want to buy them down with more paperwork, wouldn't you rather have the police officers in the street with their presence, with their feet on the ground, or would you rather behind a desk being buy down with paperwork so that they could say that the police department is transparent, hold the police department accountable? We got 50A. We got CCRB. We have the right to know act. We have all these layers, and now we just need another one. And here we are. This is the part that I don't understand about the cops that are so feeble-minded out there like our tan pants fellows out there and they'll advocate oh mayor adams is doing great for you standing by us but again i've said this before he shakes his head yes but he's really telling you no if he doesn't veto this bill because of laziness incompetence or he just doesn't care then you have to ask yourself is he really supporting you if he's telling you he supports you but he doesn't veto this bill for one he doesn't support you and he sure as hell doesn't support public safety. Listen, I'll say it again about Eric Adams. He's the most anti-police mayor we've ever had, and that includes Bill de Blasio. He's he's and and it doesn't go by his words. Bill de Blasio advocated more that he was anti-police, but he did a lot less to harm the police department than New York City Mayor Eric Adams done. Again, Bill de Blasio didn't fire or force out not even a, a 0.01% of the amount of people that New York City Mayor Eric Adams did. Um, the headcount is overall is down significantly in the first two years of Eric Adams' uh, of Eric Adams' term, as opposed to an entire eight years of Bill de Blasio. So when I look at when I look at actions, because I don't look at words, I don't care. You could tell me anything. I it doesn't even affect me. John, I love you. I'm, I love you. I would never do anything. I trust you. You're this. You're that. None of that means anything to me. It's your actions that 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 give me a feeling about people right like the words the words are words they they are what they are um but his actions identify him as the most anti-police mayor there ever been and 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 it goes for his entire administration his entire police administration too so when people are like how aren't you supporting these guys they went on the news and said this i'm like oh they said that wow that's great. So what actually is happening now? What there's more cops getting fired. CCRB is destroying careers left and right. And the majority of you guys that are on our thing will be indicted for things that have happened already. And you're just too stupid to realize that those things are coming down and you're actively being investigated by the state attorney general's office. And I'm I, I, I'm at a loss for words, you know, and me and Eric are sitting here like, wow, we're the only people actually speaking out about what is going on giving a broad overview of actually what's going on instead of just giving you a talking point, you know? And uh, so it, 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 it really is. It's really at this point, it's severely, it's, this will severely hinder police and community relations again. Hey, where'd you get those sneakers from? I have to document that. That's a stop. I, I, I but I gotta be honest, Eric, I gotta be totally honest with you. I would love to know how many encounters the NYPD has every day with people every day across New York City. I would love to know what that is for a year because that will, looking at those numbers on its face, that will prove with beyond a reasonable doubt that the New York City 
police department is the most constrained police department ever in existence in the entire country, in the entire world, where most of those interactions are overall positive interactions. I would love to know, but I don't know how anyone would ever review that data because it will be in, in it would be, I don't even know how many, how many encounters do you think a police police officers in New York city have throughout a year period? Well, I, I think it's impossible to even count that. I mean, it, especially Metropolis, 8 million people in New York city, it, it's impossible. But I will say this, if they were going to actually enact this because they actually want to record this, the encounters that the police department has, it will never, it will never be, it will be fictitious. It will never be the reality of what we had before because it's going to be robotic, right? Yep. The police are not going to engage people in the manner that they do now. Again, it, it kind of correlates to the body camera. The body camera really changed the relationship with the community and, and the police department. This will just be another layer that to, to deteriorate it. it. It's it's just completely absurd. I, 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 I It really is. You know, John and I attend a CCRB meeting on a monthly basis, and we do it virtually. And we hear all the cops talking about, you know, uh, what, what changes there should be. These are the things that we should expect the police department, the mayor, the unions to be present. You know, I'm here in Asia right now, so I'm 13 hours ahead of the clock. I attended a CCRB meeting the other day. It was at four in the morning for me. You know, I'm again, I'm retired. These guys in tan pants call me a podcast loser. I don't care. You can call me what you want. But we're helping you out. I mean, ultimately, I want to be the catalyst for change. I don't care what you guys say. Uh, it doesn't matter. I'm not doing it for you. I'm doing it for the better, for, for good. But I'm up at four in the morning, and and we're going to do a, a podcast going on in the future. But the things that we hear that's going on at CCRB, it's just inch by inch, layer by layer, to strip the police department. And it, it's just like it's an army that is trying to take down the police. you got CCRB. you got the city council. The mayor not saying anything. I mean, silence, silence is just as bad as taking action. And, and you know, I, I, I correlate it to this. You know, I hope everybody's ever seen the movie Gladiator. It's one of my favorite movies. John, you probably saw it a thousand times, I would assume. In the end of the movie where Russell Crowe, uh, you know, plays Maximus and he's supposed to fight the emperor. What does the emperor do? He approaches him. He kisses him on the cheek, stabs him in the back, and then puts his armor on so that nobody sees it. And that, I think, is exactly what's going on with the police department when it comes to CCRB and when it comes to city council. They're telling everybody, yeah, we want to send the police department out there to have a good relationship with the community. We want them to have public safety. And they stab everybody in the back and they put the police department's armor on it and cover it up so you don't see what's really going on. I think that's your best analogy ever. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to put that one up. I think that's, your, I think that's exactly what's going on. So let's bring us back. 2005, Raekwon the chef passes me. He's wearing the Jordans. I ask him where he gets the Jordan from. And I don't document that encounter. I don't put that, I don't turn my body camera on. I don't document that encounter. Uh, what is uh, CCRB going to hit me with, Eric, when I, uh, when they, oh, if they're actively investigating me because I, I don't know, I misgendered someone last week and now they have a target on my back because I called someone ma'am when they actually want to be called sir or they want to be referred by their animalistic gender, which they, or whatever they, however they identify because they're a furry and they feel that they're a cat. What, what do you think uh, I will be, what will I be, you, you know what I'll be charged with, what will I be charged with for not documenting that account? Abuse of authority all the way. I mean, you and I spoke about this offline before we started the, the podcast, right? So I just attended the CCRB meeting. We'll talk about it on a future podcast. But one of the questions I asked for the Civilian Complaint Review Board was, did they have any input when it comes to this proposed bill right now? And what position do they have on it? Obviously, it was a short answer. They didn't want to answer it. But they said that they don't have a position on it and that they don't have any input on it. But they will document if there are complaints and this, this bill is passed. So exactly that. Just like request, uh, just like uh, the right to know act. If someone requests a business card from you, if you do not present that card, you will be charged with an allegation of abuse of authority. This will be the same thing. Absolutely, and and regardless, that will be on your record for eternity. Not even just the rest of your life. For eternity, you will have abused your authority because you asked Raekwon the chef where he got his Jordan Four retro breads from, and you didn't document that stuff. 
this is what's going on. It's an emasculation. It, the bill is nonsensical, and there is zero pushback. Zero. You taking a quote in the paper is not the same thing as going online, as posting about it, naming the names, calling out the elected officials. This is America. This is what we're supposed to do. This is what your union's supposed to do. This is what you pay them for. This is what a mayor who says he believes in public safety is supposed to do. This is what a politician, and you know, shame on all your Republicans that aren't doing it. I think the only one that I seen that really spoke out on it was uh, Ina Vernikoff and um and Vicky Palladino. I didn't see I have I haven't seen soft Joe Borelli anywhere. I haven't seen him speak about anything. He makes a little comment here and there. He does actually less advocating than we do. And he's in a position to actually stop it. And he has a bigger pulp and he doesn't do anything. He just, he, cause he's, cause why? I'll tell you why. Because he wants to butter up to the get, the get stuff done administration because he wants to be probably, let's say, where do they put every Republican? Hmm. New York city buildings commissioner, right? That's where they put you, right? Eric Ulrich indicted for campaign violations for helping Eric Adams out. Then they take Staten Island borough president, former conservative Jim Miano, who I was a supporter of, who has me blocked on social media because he can't answer a question. And now he's a progressive lefty who loves Eric Adams. And, you know, obviously he has zero experience in the buildings department. Building just fell in the Bronx. So they'll be looking to replace him. Joe Borelli's term will be up. Boom, play, place in. And that's what's going on in New York City. It's a big grift. Nobody wants to bite the hand that feeds them. I don't even know what that means anymore. You, you, you are elected to serve the public, not serve a mayor, not worry about your future. We're selling out our children because people are worried about future earnings. It's a disgrace. It's disgusting. Everybody's got to start talking out. That's what we're doing on this podcast. If you think this bill is a good thing, you're welcome to come on here and talk about it. If you think that the, the 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 unions are doing a great job, you're welcome to come on here and talk about it. If you think that the upper echelon of the New York City Police Department is doing a great job, you're welcome to come on here and talk about it. John and I are very critical of the police department and the union. And everyone should be. It creates humility and it creates balance. But I think that ultimately we're extremely fair. John had put out a couple of posts, including myself, and we actually praised and we gave recognition to the PBA for securing and ensuring line of duty benefits for the wife and the family of Officer Adid, who tragically passed and, you know, fighting off duty and actually trying to combat, uh, you know, a, a police incident. I don't want to go into it, obviously, but we did give recognition and we gave praise and rightfully so. but. Again, we're going to continue to be critical. When we get back to this, the unions should be doing what John and I are doing. They should be attacking these leftists, these woke policies that are destroying the police department through social media. I wasn't a big social media guy throughout my entire career, especially my life. I was barely on social media. And I've learned the power of social media when John and I have been doing this podcast together. And, I mean, you can climb mountains with social media. It's, it's changed the game. It's changed the platform. It's changed the ability to actually have a voice. This is the weapon. The weapon is the podcast, the voice. But what, what do we see, John? What do we see? We don't see that from the unions. The only attack that we saw is the unions on the finest and filtered. The only attack that we've seen from the police department is not to BLM. It's not to Antifa. It's not to Cop Watch. It's not to Civilian Complaint Review Board. It's not to City Council. It's to the finest and filtered. So you should be asking yourself questions. Why do they care so much what these two guys are saying, right? Because Cass Daugherty said that he doesn't agree with our crime plan. Is that what we're talking about? Are we giving a crime plan? Are we giving pers perspective and analysis for an array of topics? This is a topic. This is a topic that they should be all over because this 100% will directly affect public safety. So, John, I'd like to ask you this so we can explain to the public. They want documentation to show the race, the gender, such such items for an encounter. How will the police department, how will the Civilian Complaint Review Board heavily weigh potential racial profiling and bias in these encounters? And can they ultimately do it based on the documentation? Yeah, I mean, we're going to do an upcoming podcast about uh, CCRB gaslighting everybody about how they're not going to investigate this thing and that thing, which is all just gaslighting. They're completely lying. Eric, we'll go into that in a later podcast. But 
one thing they said that they're not going to get rid of is the racial profiling unit which again i've been and i've been against this since i heard about it and i believe it was in 2016 while i was in iab because i didn't just start speaking out now i spoke out always i always i've always had the same ideology i've never changed my ideology it grew i got smarter i got wiser i got older but when i first heard about it the the chief that i spoke to with it i i ripped it to shreds i was like this is app this is based on a feeling this is how could you investigate somebody for racial profiling? It's not it's not a fair it's not a fair um, it's not fair. It's, it's it's basically going after it will be used disproportionately against male white officers, 1000 uh, percent and female white officers. It will be used to look as if there is a target against minorities. And now why I say that is it's not fair because you could take two different careers. I'll take my career, for example. I worked in the one, two, three precinct as a police officer. I was an anti-crime cop, and then I was the field intelligence officer. The overwhelming majority of my stops were male, white, and I'll even go a step further. They were Italian. They looked like me. They dressed like me. They lived in the same neighborhoods I lived in. They went to the same schools I went to. They knew the same people I knew. Um, but they want they were up to no good, and I stopped them. Right? I stopped them. I arrested them. When you look at those numbers, only a very small minority of people actually would be considered minorities um, as, as, as it relates to my career. Now you take a guy like Eric Dim while he's working in the South Bronx, which is a 99% minority makeup of a community. Guess what the majority of his stops are going to be? They're going to be stops against minorities. Now, how do you determine who's racially profiling between me and Eric? Right. I'm stopping predominantly male whites in, in a neighborhood that's predominantly male whites. He's stopping predominantly male blacks in a neighborhood that's predominantly male black. How do you how do you how do you correlate those numbers to make it make sense? Um, you can't. You know, I, I listen to Edwin Raymond's book. I read it. I listened to it. Um, and, and, you know, he talks a lot about racial profiling. And, and I and I, you know, I'll, I'll speak further on that. I want to do a, a review on that book. But that's my biggest issue is you're talking about profiling and commands that are made up of predominantly male blacks. And you're talking about being disproportionately used, but you don't talk about the white areas that the tactics are deployed just the same. The stops and the pressures are exactly the same. Now, I don't know what was going on in transit. I was never a transit cop. But top side, the numbers were the numbers. And however the police department was, that's where they did non-discriminately. I think that was a fantastic perspective. As you said, we plan on doing a podcast in the future rather soon in regards to the last monthly meeting of CCRB that uh, I had attended virtually where we gathered some information that I think is extremely imperative to the public and it hasn't been released completely accurate. So we're going to get into that. But that's exactly where uh, I was actually hoping that you would take the path down with that question and you actually answered exactly which I expected. I think that you answered exactly to, to the T of wh where we should be thinking. And that's a great correlation because, again, you don't necessarily get to choose where you pick. Those cards are dealt for you in the police department. So you're faced with the demographics and the geographical area of employment, and you address it according to what the crime is. And I think the argument that would be made by the city council and the CCRB is they would say, well, Eric Dim had more encounters of male blacks than John McCarry had of male whites. That argument could be made. However, unfortunately, and it's not a, it's not a racial issue, it is a fact that the 4-0 precinct, the 4-2 precinct, and the confines of housing has a much higher crime rate than that of the 1-2-3. And the 4-0 and the 4-2 precinct happens to be heavily, predominantly black and Hispanic. And the one, two, three precinct is heavily predominantly white, or like as you said, Italian. So it comes down to geographical area of employment and the demographics. I think it's a fantastic view. And I think CCRB and city council thinks that there's emotion involved. And I think it's just something that can't be proven. Um, I think we should go further into this and, and talk about how this, this bill, I think, will just completely bring policing to a halt and how it will ultimately affect public safety. And most importantly, right now with this financial crisis, how will it affect the budget and especially overtime? 
I mean, it's a lot right there. So I'm going to say right now it's going to stop stops. People aren't going to interact with the public. So, I mean, that's a huge loss right there. It's a huge loss for intelligence gathering. It's a huge loss for community relations. It's a huge loss for the public. It's a huge loss for the police officers who already feel isolated from the public. You know, I, I, you know, and when you don't feel as if you're a member of that community, I personally believe at that point you should step away from policing um, because it's, it, it's you're ineffective at this point and it's it's an us first stem mentality and now you have it right and 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 it's a dangerous dangerous thing for both sides and us first them um i believe that will great greatly attribute to that and by attributing to even less stops what we're going to see is a rise in crime we're going to see the more scrutiny more more scrutiny amongst the police department which again this will just add to what's already happening. Nothing's being done to stop this other than money getting thrown at you. But like I said, and like a lot of people said in that career, life's more important than money. Your morals are more important than money. Your health, your mental health, all your family, being home with your children, being with your wife, being with your family. These things are going to start to become more at the forefront. And they already have, right? Because again, people are just sick of working seven days a week. So the exodus will continue in the New York City Police Department, and that will ultimately raise the overtime budget, right? Um, and as they as they continue to cut, you continue to cut services from New York City, the overtime budget will just raise. You cut services from the New York City Police Department, more people leave, units get broken down, guys that were going to stay past 20 years, which aren't a lot, just a select few, they will they will opt to leave at that point, right? They'll be doing stuff that they'll believe is beneath them. I'm a first grade detective. I sign a violent felony squad and I stand on a foot post. Or, you know, I stand on a foot post most of my week. They will opt to leave. You know, once they hit their number or they make enough money, they're going to say, you know what? Or, or they just can't do it anymore. I'm working seven days a week. I don't feel right. I feel unhealthy. My wife hates me. I never see my kids. I want to be home more. I only get these five weeks off. They're going to retire. The, the, and, and, and it's just honestly, at this point, the New York City Police Department is in a death spiral. Um, and I don't see it being recoverable under this mayor because he's just I think Chris Paul was dead accurate when Chris Paul said that he's incapable of steering the ship. He was 100 percent accurate. And again, Chris Paul did not get fired for criticizing the men and women in the New York City Police Department. He only uttered what Eric Adams, what he heard from Eric Adams. He just said what they were saying in that office. So Chris Ball, in my opinion, was right. Dude, I ain't gonna lie, man. You got me right here, dude. I, I like, wow, like in my heart, that hit me because when you said that, you know what, you won't be members of the community anymore and you should just leave the profession. Because I think back, what people don't understand, I don't want an award for this. And that's not why I'm mentioning it. Because John, I know you do the same thing. Man, I used to have two pockets worth of money. One pocket was for me, and I always had money in another pocket that I used to always give to the community. It was plenty of times I brought I brought kids ice cream, and there were kids, their fathers were in jail, and plenty of times, you know what, they needed money. I gave kids money for clothes, and I participated in basketball games constantly. At least in the summer, two, three basketball games a month. And I, we, I had a relationship with the kids and the community, even bad guys, bad guys, good guys. You know what? When we used to play basketball together, we were all the same on the court. And we would have fun. I, I mean, I had a relationship with these people in the community. Like, hey, what's up, man? You, you know, you, you know, I get to wax your ass tomorrow, you know? <laughs> and But we had a good time, man. You know, people I locked up, and we would play together. We would play basketball. This would just completely deteriorate it. I mean, it just it, – you and I use this word all the time. There won't be any organic relationships anymore because now you're going to, I mean, forget about, we talk about micromanagement. Now you're micromanaging just complete critical thinking and, and potential for any human relationships. Now you're on the corner, you're a brand new cop and you're walking your beat and you're like, hey, you know what? The guy's dri dribbling a basketball. I love to joke around with him and, dri and dribble the basketball with him. But if I talk to him, am I, am I going to have to document this? Will I have to fill out paperwork? Is this a potential setup for a civilian complaint? Is someone going to the viewers and say, oh, I was having a conversation with someone who's black and I'm white? 
I, I think this is headed down a dangerous path. And it's so ironic that it's called the common sense reform. This is the furthest thing from it. This will destroy any relations. They came out with this that neighborhood coordination officer program to have a relationship. You don't need that. You just need normal humanity and just stop with all these layers. Let the cops be normal. Let the community be normal. And organically, it will happen. Will there be bad relationships? Of course. You're never going to have 100% uh, you know, just a clean slate effort. But we will have the best margin of error that we can have. And we'll deal with it as it comes. It's it's just I I just again I just can't say the stupidity enough I I really like the stupidity in New York City it's just it's it's to a new level and and you know I, I only I like I relate it to like when I seen it getting really bad was when they started to demonize um uh, male black and male Hispanic were locked up at a disproportionate rate for marijuana and it wasn't really representative of something that was that was racist. It was representative of something that was socioeconomic, but they made it that the police department was racist, right? Because they never looked at the total factors. And that's what I'm saying here is they're not going to look at the total factors. So when kids are getting locked up in the Bronx and in Brooklyn and Queens and in Manhattan for smoking marijuana, they're doing it because they're getting arrested. They live in a high dense area, high density area. They're doing it right out on New York City streets in New York City parks. It's not their fault, right? They don't have trees and woods to go into or big backyards to go into. They're committing a minor crime on a public street, right? And it's more accessible to the public. There's more eyes to watch them do it. When they smoked the marijuana, people smelled it, called 911 on them. The cops came and just enforced the law, right? They were given the same amount of C summonses and the same amount of arrests that you got in white neighborhoods. The only difference in the majority of white neighborhoods is these kids did it a lot in their backyards. They did it a lot in wooded areas where there's still woods in parts of Staten Island and in other parts of Queens, stuff like that, and the beach. And they were able to hide because of the geographic location. And that was a, is a socioeconomic difference. But they didn't attack it, say, hey, well, poor kids, kids that grow up in large, dense areas are being arrested for this more. No, they said black and brown. And it was true, but they never took the geographic and, and they never took the geographic and the demographics of those geographics into account. They just took the stupidest, dumbest form of it. And they're like, oh, it's because cops are racist. And that's exactly what's going to happen here. And it's going to exasperate it. If this bill passes and they put it in, the stops against male blacks and browns in the areas that are already disproportionate. And the same in the areas where there's a majority male whites that are already disproportionate, they're going to increase because the amount of stops is going to go through the fucking roof. Even though they're not in stops, they're just encounters. It's just every day-to-day -day encounter. And they're going to use it to further demonize the police department, to further emasculate the police department, to further create legislation, nonsensical legislation, that these appointed managers are going to sit there and do absolutely nothing. What are they going to do? They're going to get up on the news. Crimes down, just take out 2018, 2019, 2020, 2021, 2020. If you compare the crime rate to the summer, the May of 1975, we're actually at a historic low. May of 1975, we're at a historic low right now. <laughs> it's so true. The police department does a great job at manipulating. I tell you what, honestly, if I was selling cars and I owned, if I owned a car, used car dealership, I would definitely hire John Shell. I would hire Michael Kemper because and I would hire the Petri. These guys can sell the rims over car. <laughs> Let me tell you, because they, they're just giving you bullshit, honestly. And you know why they hate the finest unfiltered so much, John? You know it. You know why they hate us so much? Because now they can't gaslight. They can't give the media corrupt information because guess what? We're going to be right there like, uh-uh. Nope. That's a lie. Nope. That's a lie. And we're going to give you the correct information. That's why they don't like us. Because the jig is up right now. They can't fool the media anymore. Because now we know the inner linings of the police department. And we are speaking out. Some people have said we didn't speak out before. You know what? We did. That's why we were met with opposition on the job. We just didn't speak out on social media as we do now. We were the squeaky wheel. And the squeaky wheel gets the oil. And we're doing it right now. And, you know, it's just insane. Now, one more thing I want to mention, which we didn't mention, 
there's a second component to this bill. It's not it's not uh, as important because it's already documented. But the other component to this bill is the uh, consent to search. So if a police officer has asked someone for consent to search a vehicle or their person, they're supposed to document, it, which they're doing already. But in this bill, they want more information, race and gender. Uh, I think it's absolutely absurd because initially, and John, I'm sure you're aware of this. Initially, when this came about, the agreement was that the police department would would collect data for consenting to search, but they weren't they weren't compelled to actually have to document. But the police department went out of their way, believe it or not, kudos to them. They actually went out of their way to document the consent to searches, and even with that. Jumani Williams is pushing to have more information in this documentation that they really didn't have to have, which I, I, I find quite interesting. I mean, you know, I, I just think that, like, you know, when they draft these bills, it's just a complete echo chamber. I think the most conservative people while they draft these bills are far to the left of where we sit. You know what I mean? And far to the like and the understanding of police and, and public safety. Um, again, it's just more data to scrutinize. It has nothing to, it's not going to, it's not going to do anything to, you know, we, we, we saw that, that documentation from, uh, the inspector general where they said that, I think, I think it was a lot. I think it was 40%. I could be wrong. I think it was 40%. They said the stops were bad. I don't know how accurate that is. Uh, I, I would question even th the comments by the inspector general. Uh, I'm not sure that that would, I wouldn't hold that say, oh yeah, it's hundred percent accurate. But what they're saying is that a lot of those stops were being conducted bad. I don't think anything that this bill is going to do is going to detract from that. Let's say that, that, that statement was hundred percent accurate. All it's going to do is, is stop cops from actually interacting only. It's only going to be when they have to. And it's a bad, bad precedent. Well, I think that that documentation ahead is the, is the furthest thing from the truth. And the reason is because the federal monitor that was involved in the stop question first. The agitation of the police department right before we have what was called a UF 250 universal form 250 form for the police department, the NYPD, where it was documented. If you had a level three encounter, which is you reasonably suspect someone committed a crime, you would document on a 250. It was a, John, you remember, it was a two-sided card. It mostly had check boxes. And it was pretty much just documentation to say, hey, you know what? John McCary, I, you know, just uh, rhetorically speaking, I suspect him of committing a robbery. I had an encounter with him. He has a couple of check boxes of what led to the reason of, of suspicion. On the back, here's some additional factors. And they were pretty much che check boxes. And then you signed it. And it was just to document that, hey, this person, you know what? I detained them according to the Fourth Amendment. But the federal monitor went further, and they want an actual narrative of why you suspect the person committed a crime. What was the demeanor of the person during the stop? What led to the stop? And what they want is basically like a Harvard, a Harvard essay. And I think that's the problem, is they're expecting police officers to document the most trivial, trivial thing. And John, I said this when you interviewed me back before we started this podcast together. It's the most trivial thing to articulate an encounter that you have someone from actually doing it on the street. And I, I, you could be a Harvard grad, you could go to Yale, I don't care, you could just be a high school grad. It's probably the most difficult thing to actually document on paper. What do you think about that? I mean, you would it would it would take you a good portion of, the, of your tour to actually if you if you went into each encounter. Yeah, absolutely. Um especially Again, I think most cops act properly and act within the law. They just have a very hard time at articulating it. Um, not because they're bad cops. I think it's just it's just related to their training and what the, the the volume of stops and encounters they have each day in on New York City streets and the amount of I forget even the stops, the amount of jobs that they have to answer to on top of that. Um, I just think this is complete nonsense. You know, so much more should be being said by the New York City Police Department. So much more should be being said by the, by the, the police unions. Honestly, so much more should be said by the rank and file cops. Um, and, you know, I think this is probably the strongest message you'll hear. And that's probably it's very sad. It's a sad state of affairs in the New York City Police Department. And again, you know, there will be people to come on and attack us about this messaging as well who are 
cops. And I, I personally believe they align more with the BLM and Antifa than they do with American values or the values of a law enforcement officer. And it's it's a sad state of affairs in New York City. And that's who's running the, running the department right now. Um, it needs to change immediately. And hopefully it will. Dude, I think you're 100% right. Let me tell you. That is so accurate. You know, I love correlations. I love to give analysis and, and compare things. And it's almost like the movie Departed. And when Jack Nicholson plays the part and he says he says to uh, Matt Damon, as you know, the kid is supposed to be Matt Damon who's corrupt as a kid. And he says, you know, when you're staring down the barrel of a gun, whether you're a cop or a perp, what's the difference? And, and, and it's almost the same thing. I think that these cops that they don't even realize it, they do they do line up with BLM and Antifa. They just don't even know it. They really don't know it, and, and, and it's sad. But I, I just want to go one, one more further when it comes to documentation for the stuff, why it's so difficult. You know, it's almost like I, I personally, I, I, don't know how to, I don't know how to fix the inner linings of a car. But so if a mechanic was going to explain to me how to fix a, a fuel injector or fi fix a, a carburetor and actually wrote it on paper and used all the terminology, I can read that thing 10 times. I have no idea what I'm reading. It's a waste of time. And it's the same thing for a police officer when they're documenting a stop. You can read it all you want because you're not going to understand what that police officer does because of subtle movements and what they see is something that you don't see. And that's why I think it's so difficult to transcribe what happens on an encounter on paper because what the cop sees they don't see and the public is not going to understand what the federal monitor they want they want this plain writing they want it simplicity so that they can understand it and the reality is you're not going to understand it unless you're actually educated in it and actually have hands-on of actually doing it absolutely you have to draft an essay and go into court case law and how that and how that that actually encounter affects court um, I mean, you know, it's just stops or yeah, there's district, there's people in the job that don't understand. I remember one night I was in an unmarked car. It was about two o'clock in the morning. I'm in an area of Huguenot, no buses and trains in the area. I see a male walking. I've arrested him before. I'm literally sitting at a red light. I'm sitting at a red light. I'm not about to stop him. He has two laptop bags, raises my antennas. I'm not going to lie. I look at him from the vehicle. I don't say a word. He runs and jumps into a bush and hides in the bush in a house. I'm like, that is insane. He ran at the sight of the police. He didn't run because I stopped him. He ran at the sight of the police carrying two laptop bags in an area where we we had a, a, a citywide pattern that was, we had, a, I'm sorry, a borough-wide pattern of car break-ins. And that's why I was out there still at 2 o'clock in the morning. My normal tour was 6 to 2. And um, I just walked up to him. I said, hey, what are you doing in the bush? And he he's not coming out. He's doing furtive. So I pull him out of the bush. I want to make sure I'm not going to get shot. I take him out. He has no laptop bags on him. I'm like, where are the two laptop bags you were carrying? I didn't have any laptop bags on me. Boom. Takes the I take the laptop bags. I go in the laptop. First laptop I open up, I see a company name on it. I remember because I knew my neighborhood. I remember that there was a, a van, a commercial van that always parked illegally, not far from there with the same company name. It was the only time I've ever seen that company name. And I remembered it. Uh, I detained him. I had another I had my, my other my other team come over. They detained him. I went to that that address that I remembered. I knocked on the guy's door. I said, hey, are you missing anything out of the back of your truck? He said, yeah, I'm missing my laptop, and boom, boom, I get him, right? He's under arrest, writes a whole confession, blah, 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 blah. The desk sergeant told me I didn't have probable cause to stop him. The district attorney told me I didn't have probable cause to stop him. And I literally had to go into over and over again and argue the point of why I was able to stop him, right? He wasn't, he didn't, I knew that he didn't live there. I, he ran at the sight of me. I mean, any reasonable person that wasn't a police officer would be like, if I didn't enact further on that, if I didn't investigate that, what are you even paying the police for? Why even have a police force? First of all, I think it's excellent police work. That's what makes you a cop. That's exactly what we should expect from our police department is being intrusive. I mean, if you did it, 
if you didn't ha act on what you saw, if you didn't use those observation skills, honestly, I would think you're not even a cop. What are you doing? How could you actually just drive away from that? As you said, I used to tell the, uh, I used to tell the, the, the new guys, you know, I used to, as a special operations lieutenant, I would take part in orientation, taught the, the brand new rookies that came out of police academy. And, and I used to say to them, you know, um, unfortunately, when you are part of the system, whether you work at the police department, the district attorney's office, civilian complaint review board, city council, they inject an idiot pill in your, in, in your head and you no longer think like a normal person. Because before you were a cop or you before you're part of this organization, if you saw someone do something, you'd be like, ah, I don't know what, what the law is. I don't know exactly what the legal term is, but that's not right. The police are going to get you. That's what a normal, right? If you saw that, you're like, you know, police are going to stop you. But then we get that idiot pill injected in our head. Like, oh, wait a minute. Is there liability? Can I stop them? Can I not? Can I explain this? And it just really destroys it. All this stuff affects public safety. It, it really is a shame. You can't think like a normal person anymore. That's why I said once you go to the police department or any government organization, your life changes forever. A normal person sees three guys hanging out in front of a store on any street in New York City, and the gate's down, and it's late at night, and it's it's below zero, and they're standing there freezing, uh, but they're standing there for a long period of time. A normal person, like, these guys are up to no good, right? But what happens right now? If you encounter three black guys that are on Webster Avenue at two in the morning below zero, standing in front of a gate that's down, and you actually talk to them, right? Request for information, objective reason to approach. The store's closed. There's burglaries going on. But now what? Now you're racist. Absolutely. And, and you know, try to document that on, on, a, on, a, on a stop report. You're, you're literally going to be drafting a complaint that should be that should that have you should have drafted with the district attorney's office. You're literally going to be sitting there and it takes them a while to do it. And some of them even can't do it. They run to their supervisors. You would literally be imagine doing that for every stop. You know, I mean, I, I think on that for that 61 and that online, it was a TPO defendant was found in possession of criminal stolen uh, was found to be in possession of uh, stolen property. Right. And then and then there was multiple onlines because he had multiple property that I was able to track back to different locations. That was just the initial encounter. Once I went through the bag, he had GPSs. I would hit home on the GPS, go to that house. And I actually closed the borough pattern because of that arrest that the sergeant said I didn't have probable cause for on the desk, that the district attorney said I didn't have probable cause for. Ultimately, he was charged with it. But I had to fight and explain case law and say I did not stop him. I didn't stop him. And he ran. He ran at the sight of the police. That raised my suspicion once. Then he's in the bushes. I know he doesn't live there. I'm like, why are you in the bushes? He dumps the bags. He says, I didn't have the bag. It raises my suspicion again. Now he's lying to me. Now I'm asking intrusive questions. Whose property is this? I, I don't know. I, I didn't have those bags. Those bags weren't mine. Boom. Now I have probable cause. Once I get to that location, I'm able to identify that this property is not his. And I seen him clear as day in possession of it. And he tried again, tried to run at the side of the police. So it's just like to try to document each and everything in the New York City Police Department. I mean, and that I think that collar was like, I swear, I think I was at the command for like three days. I don't even remember. I mean, and that was already like towards the end of my shift um, and like, you know, led into search warrants and a million other different things. Um, and it's just, you know, it, it's, the, it's just, I, I don't know. I, I, I just don't understand what, what more they want at this point. What, what I, I and again, and I think that, that, uh, I think that we label out what it is. It's, they want to completely abolish the police department. It's just a slow step increment, 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 increment. And I, I truly think that the leadership in the, in the department, is well aware of what we're saying and agrees with what we're saying. And that's why they want us to not say it because it'll just show really in the annals of history, uh, they will be looked on in a very negative light. I also think that this will deteriorate discretion, right? Because discretion is, is, is the best tool that a cop has. We talk about this all the time, right? So, for people that watch this, if you're not sure what discretion is, but when a police officer has probable cause, which means they reasonably they reasonably believe someone committed a crime, you have the right to make that arrest. But what you also have is discretion, the ability to say, you know what, I'm not going to make this arrest. Maybe it's better good for the future. Maybe it's a better relationship that I could have with this person, or maybe it's the better of this person, or maybe they just had a bad day. But you know what, let's say, for instance, you see someone by uh, a bag of crack, a bag of coke on the street, 
you know what? And, and you see this person and you approach them. Immediately you see someone buy drugs, you have probable cause. They're under arrest. So now if I decide to use my discretion, say, you know what? Let's say I have a good conversation with this person. They're from out of town. They got hooked on drugs. And maybe I can lead them in the right direction to get help through rehab instead of, instead of placing them under arrest. And you know what? That's a probable cause encounter on the street where I, I don't have to document anything other than my memo book. I didn't bring them into the precinct, so I don't have to do a, an arrest report sheet, an online booking sheet. I don't have to do a stop report because it's not a level three encounter. I didn't detain them against their will under the Fourth Amendment. I have probable cause. I have the right to arrest them. But I decide not to arrest them for the better good of this person or it just, you know, this is a substance abuser. Maybe they don't have a, a history. But now with this How Many Stops Act, I'm better off actually making that arrest because I have to document it anyway to cover myself that, to show that I wasn't racist or I didn't have any views of racial profiling. What, what are your views on that? Do you believe that I'm right, that this would tailor away from discretion? 100% tear away from discretion. It's going gonna, it's gonna to tear away from community interaction. So it's going to lead down the line to where it, it, it crushes. I mean, just go back to what you were saying, right? And, and that's something I always did. I always went in my pocket. Always went. My, and you could ask any. I would go in my pocket for anything. Somebody was fundraising money for anything. Boom. Kids are on at a, at, at a gathered around the ice cream truck. I stop. Boom. Buy them all ice cream. Right. Think about that. Think about that. You walk up to an ice cream truck. You see kids around it. You see some kids in the back because, you know, they don't got money. Yo, come here. I'll get you ice cream. Do you want ice cream? I have to document that. Do you want ice cream? <laughs> Is, that, is, is this a joke? Like, and then and then the police department went further. It's like we want to reward you, so put that in this little app and tell us the good work you did. Get that. Get out of here. I'm not doing that for you to see it or for you to tell me that I'm a good cop or any of that other stuff. I'm doing that for some of you, right? Because these are things I believe. These are, this is the, the things that I remember from the police when I was growing up. Right. I remember them coming in sometimes. And sometimes you would get guys they like that guy's an asshole. Stay away from him. And sometimes you'd be like, that guy's a nice guy. That guy's actually a good guy. I like that guy. You know what I mean? And, and you know, and they're deterring. They're going to deter that interaction. So, of course, it's going to stem to the, the, you know, the discretion. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's going to have a, a major impact completely down the line. And at the end of the day, I'm going to just say it plain as day. The cops aren't going to do it. I know I'm not going to do it. I know you wouldn't do it. I know the majority of people, we're going to be like, screw you. We're going to do what we did anyway. But now we're going to get in trouble for it. And we're going to get abusive authority and all this other stuff. And it's just really going to paint more towards the us versus them mentality. And it, it it's terrible. It's terrible. And again, I, I think the other problem is now the Civilian Complaint Review Board along with the police department, is going to weaponize your body camera footage against you. Because if these stops, I'm sorry, stop, not stops, if these encounters have to be documented, then what goes along with it? Body camera footage. Did you put your body camera on at the exact time that you had this encounter with the person? Then you have the entire encounter. Does the body camera footage match your documentation? I mean, did no, you leave I, I don't the know. camera footage correctly? Did you do this? Yeah. Oh, you Able it correctly. Oh, now we have to hit your sergeant and your lieutenant, and and we're gonna and we're gonna go after the captain too because your body camera footage wasn't labeled correctly. It's like, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I answered thirty jobs that day. I, I forgot that I bought the kid ice cream, and uh, I'm sorry I didn't document. I bought a bunch of kids. I should have did thirty uh, encounter reports, stop reports, so you know how. Just, so city council could come up with a clear uh, evidence based uh, public safety strategy. Sorry. I mean, who really wants this job? I mean. It's impossible. You go, you go to roll call and they, you go to roll call. Your sergeant is inspecting you. You got you got the chief sitting at one police plaza. They're inspecting you. You go out in the street and every encounter you have to document. Every encounter has to be documented along with body camera footage. Other than the tan pants, who wants this job? Honestly, they're, they're the only ones right now. Right? Listen, I get it. They're advocating for their bosses right now because they're the only ones that actually – can do this job without getting in trouble. I mean, I'm sure that they're not going to have to worry about documentation. These guys can do anything they want. I mean, they can attack a podcast on social media. These guys can do anything. But and for everybody else, for general population, the police department, that's some blue pants. How are they going to do this job? I think it's impossible.
Oh, yeah. I mean, the only people that that honestly should be on the job at this point is the people that think that they can hang on long enough to get into positions of leadership to actually make a change that will understand the pitfalls of what's going on. And and but those will be the people that are in the trenches. Right. You know, those are going to be the guys that are in the trenches and they're going to be the ones that maybe maybe it's not even from the police department. Maybe they take their experience and they run for elected office, you know, or, you know, they try to get into, you know, do, doing things like that because, I mean, obviously, it's 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 going to be a very hard road, if not impossible, to do it from internally. Um, so I don't I don't know who's going to take this job. I mean, it's going to be a last resort. It's going to be taken just to await other city titles, or it's going to be just a complete. I, I had no better option at that point, so I took the I took the police. You know, I went on them. They hired me first, and that's it. I agree. Speaking of of impossible and uh avenues for police officers i did see something good i don't know if you saw it this is the best thing i've seen in a long time but there's some type of municipal uh bill that was passed where police officers of new york city can do a lateral move to police departments in westchester without taking the test they just need a a, a resume and an interview which uh i don't know if you saw that that's the best thing i've seen in a long time because uh, i mean i mean it's great it's great. It's more yeah. gaslighting now. Uh, it's a good bill. I, I think it's more gaslighting now because I mean, you know, a lot of people reached out to me. Oh, post this, and I'm like, I'm not going to post it because it's just going to raise red flags the minute I post it. I was like, I'm not posting it. I said, and I'll tell you right now, if a lot of you guys start leaving because of that, they're going to do exactly what they did when when all the guys were trying to go to Port Authority. They're going to block your paperwork. And that department's not going to accept you. And by the way, the majority, you can't even go anymore because you have open CCRBs. You have abuses of authority. You have all these other stuff. And they're not going to release the data to them. And that department's not going to want to take you. And honestly, you're all the minute you walk in the New York City Police Department, you answer one nine one one call. You're already tainted. Good luck ever getting a federal job or, or going to a different department. I don't I again, I think I think sounds great. Sounds great, but I, I just I don't see it. I don't see how the police department in this diminished state where they can't recruit, they can't retain. I don't see them actively letting people leave. I'll tell you right now, if I was the mayor, I wouldn't let anybody leave. I would just I would be I would be looking to get people in and and restoring what we have and keep it and being able to retain. Once I'm able to retain, then I'll start to try to recruit. You know, um, you know, I'll be recruiting, but then I could focus all my efforts on the recruiting effort once we're able to retain. I mean, this is this is an embarrassment. I mean, seriously, this has never happened before. The fact that me and you are sitting here is it's just the biggest hypocrisy ever. And, and I think that's even bigger than the podcast or the messaging that we're putting out. It's just it really is. It's the biggest hypocrisy. We should both be captains right now in the New York City Police Department. And, you know, instead of weighing in on these political issues, um, but everything happens for a reason, and I'm I'm glad that we're here to do it because someone needs to do it, and this is long overdue. So, uh, yeah, that's it. That's all. I, that's all I really got on that bill. I just I think I think it's terrible, and I think the the messaging is uh is awful. And I I again I think that this bill is positive, but I don't think that you're actually going to be able to act on it. Yeah, I, I agree. You know what? what you're saying i thought about this also i said it sounds great yes i think ultimately which i didn't get a chance to say that it would have to be anyone pretty much with less than three years on the job because if you have more than three years in a police department and you're active you're out on the street and you're doing a truce of police work and you're wearing blue pants good luck it's it, it, you, that opportunity is going to be gone for you you would have to have less than three years on the job but that's a good point because i didn't even think about that what you were saying in comparison to poor authority because i do believe those people under three years they may try to block them because I think the argument with the NYPD would say, hey, listen, I don't know I don't know what it costs to train a cop. Maybe it costs a million dollars. You say, hey, we spent a million dollars on these cops, and we're not willing to give them to you unless you, you give us uh, – unless you pay us. They're probably going to want some type of stipend from, from uh, the New York City Police Department. Uh, I mean, so that's a great point. It's unfortunate. It's a nice bill to see, but you know, it's a great point that I, I actually didn't think of. I did think that it would have to be people under three years because of the 58. But that's a great point. I mean, they could definitely block them out, just like they, just as they do with the Port Authority, which is, which is sad. I mean, and again, exactly what you said. The veterans of this job are gone. They're unvaccinated. You know, their their CCRB records are insane. They're, um, you know, they're hanging out with Roger Stone. The cops that you want out in the street, they're gone. They've been removed, and it's been replaced with woke, progressive cops that align with the identity politics that we see right now. They're becoming leaders. 
I'm sorry, appointed managers within the police department. It's, it's just a, it, it really is a vicious cycle. You're right. We should be captains and, and even further because the people right now that are out there, John Shell, LePetri, Kaz Daughtry, Madry, they don't come on this podcast because they don't agree with us because they know they can't hold the room with us and they can't debunk what we're saying. So with that, if you don't want to talk about the perspective and analysis, if you'd like to come on this podcast and memorialize your careers, we're willing to do that too. This, this platform is open to anybody. Anyone is welcome. We don't close the door on anyone. Everyone has an invitation. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, we nailed this one home. I think we're going on an hour 25. Guys, if you like it, you know, if you like, enjoy our content, please like and subscribe, share our content. Uh, we appreciate everything, you know, all, all the all the all the positive and honestly, even the negative feedback that what that's what this platform is. It's it's for you to be able to raise your voice. We welcome the we welcome it. We just again, we just don't want vicious attacks coming from from active cops that's that's ridiculous and you could criticize us as active cops but not not viciously not trying to hurt us our families looking into where we're making money like that's i'm not we're not trying to hurt you where you make money i mean that those those things really really anger me i know they were anger eric um you know the comments whatever we don't care you know um do do and say as you please you know um eric you got anything to add before we close Sure, I saw a I saw a message. It was by a, a by an Indian guru, and it was actually on, it was on social media, and he said something, and I really thought about it after the attacks that we had from fellow cops, and, and I don't take it personal, but I was angry and disappointed in 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 their behavior. I was I was just I was shocked. But what this guru said is, you know what, anger is self punishment. You can't control someone else's behavior, so that's my response to them. I refuse to punish myself with anger. I can't control your behavior. If you want to tarnish your shield and disrespect the shield that you wear, so be it. You're on a dangerous path, but I'm not going to be angry about it. Instead, I feel sorry for you. Absolutely. And I and again, I, I believe we're on the right path and we're on the right side of history. So, uh, guys, uh, please, if you're, uh, if you're getting ready to retire, call our friends John and Henry at Lead Law Blue. If you're in retirement, you're unhappy with uh, your your uh, financial advisors, call our friends John and Henry in Blue. If you're a rookie and you just want some information, give them a buzz. Calls free. Consultations are free. Give them a call. Tell them we sent you. And that's it, guys. Uh, 265 Police Live brought to you by New York's Finance Retirement Unfiltered Podcast. We'll be right back at you. Law enforcement professionals dedicate their lives to serving and protecting our community. But who's protecting their financial futures? That's where Laidlaw Blue comes in. Our wealth management platform is specifically designed for the law enforcement community. Laidlaw Blue is a division within Laidlaw Wealth Management run by retired New York City detective John McDermott. His status as a retired detective uniquely positions him to establish a deep connection between Laidlaw Blue and the law enforcement community. Our platform is easy to use and provides a range of financial services, including investment management, retirement planning, and insurance solutions. With Laidlaw Blue, you can secure your financial future and provide for your loved ones. Our team of experienced financial advisors understands the unique challenges and opportunities that law enforcement professionals face. We're here to help you navigate the complexities of financial planning and achieve your goals. Laidlaw Blue, secure your financial future today. Book a meeting using the QR code displayed or call us directly on 888-901-BLUE. That's 888-901-BLUE.